name is Jacob Todson, and welcome back to the Wisdom of Odin. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you the mythology and folklore around one of Scotland's most popular destinations, the Isle of Skye. But before we cover the mythology, let's talk a little bit about the history of this mysterious place. The ancient Vikings called this place the Isle of Mist or the Isle of Clouds. Hopefully you can see why they would call this place home, as it looks very similar to their native land of Norway. With towering mountains, fjords and lochs, cold seas and black cliffs, the imprint of the Viking immigrants that raided here, stayed here, and intermingled with the native Scots lasts even in the namesake of this island. Over 60% of the place names here in the Isle of Skye come from Scandinavian origins, including the name we call it today, Skye. The Vikings were not the first people to set their eyes on this beautiful island on the west end of Scotland. Long before they arrived in around the 10th century, several different native groups called this place home, going all the way back to the prehistoric times, as evidence of flint arrowheads have been found here, showing that this place has been inhabited at least by the hunter-gatherers going back thousands of years. Even further into history, we do have some remnants of Iron Age and Bronze Age hill forts and Neolithic sites. If you actually look at a map of the prehistoric sites here in the Isle of Skye, you'll see that many of them are hill forts on the western shores. This is actually something that persists into the later eras, as many castles have been built along the shores of the Isle of Skye, because this area has not always had roads. In the ancient past, the only way to get to this island and trade along the western locks and fjords of Scotland was by boat. And so the Isles of Scotland, particularly the Isle of Skye, was a really important trade network hub where many people would travel up and down the rivers and locks, waging wars on one another to maintain control of this beautiful area. As high tide is beginning, I will also say the Picts made their way here as well. I saw an ancient Pictish standing stone in the northern part of the Isles that has left here since the 7th or 8th century when it was carved by the Picts escaping the Scots as they moved across the land. Now the Picts, being the original natives of Scotland as far as we know, were removed by the Gaelic Scots moving in from Ireland. As they escaped, they moved further west, and the Isle of Skye may be the one of the last few places that the Picts truly survived culturally and maybe even religiously. Now, while the Vikings did stay here for several hundred years, intermarrying with the Gaelic Scots that lived here, little is left behind as far as archaeological evidence. In the last 20 years or so, there has been one piece of evidence found in the southern part of the Isle of Skye in the form of a Viking Age canal that was around a port city that they would have had in the ancient past. Sadly, I was not able to show you this in this video because it's around a four hour hike to get to uh, and it's on the southernmost part of the Isle. Now, besides the naming and the archaeological evidence, there is some remainder of the Norse society that used to live here. One of my favorite terms I learned recently in the museum here in the Isle of Skye is the term Gal Gale, I believe it's how it's pronounced, which is a term used for people who blended Norse culture and the native Celtic culture, the Scottish culture. And this is something I think we see in this modern era as many people blend the two faiths in the modern pagan practices of Norse paganism and Celtic paganism. And we'll see that even later when we discuss the clans of Scotland, most notably the clan of MacDonald. This is the third time I've had to move the camera as High Tide continues to move further along. But hopefully from this beautiful view, you can see why the Vikings called this the Isle of Mist and Isle of Cloud. It's strikingly beautiful, dark and haunting, much like the mythology of the ancient Viking peoples. This blended with the cultures of the Scots, created a very unique identity for the people that lived here in the Isle of Skye, and would eventually become the Lords of the Isles. Now we will speak of the legends of how the Ku Kulin Mountains were both made and named. Long ago, only the giants called Skye home. The witch known as the Kaliak Vur lived among them, and ensured that spring would never come to the Isle. It was she who made Scotland with a rock and a piece of peat that she brought from the Great North and had dropped into the sea. The god of spring hated her for hoarding the isle all to herself, so he appealed to the sun to help him chase away the Kaliak from the land. The sun listened to his request and threw a spear towards Skye that ruptured the earth where it fell. Where the spear struck spewed flames and fire across the isle, the sudden heat would chase away the Kaliak to hide within the roots of the holly plant, and from this rupture in the earth came the mountains that would be named the Kukulans. The origin of their name comes from the time when humanity was young and the warrior Cúchulain journeyed north from Ireland to learn from a great teacher of war. This teacher was one of the few to call Skye home in the early days, and she lived in an impressive fortress called Dunscath, the Fortress of Shadows. And her name was Scathic, the Shadowy One. And I must say, this segment of the video is the one I've been looking forward to the most to share with you, because behind me here is the castle of Dune Scott. Yeah. 
It was at this castle she would teach warriors from all around the world in the ways of martial arts. Gukolin was young and proud, and thought himself a legend around the world. But when he arrived in Scothic's Hall, he was treated as a lowly boy, which brought a fire in his chest. He then proceeded to challenge every warrior in the fortress to combat, whom he then quickly defeated. After defeating all the warriors in Scothic's Hall, Scothic then gave permission to Kukulin to fight her only daughter in single combat. They fought day and night, and eventually, Kukulin called himself victorious. This left only Scothic and Kukulin, who took their fight to the mountains that lasted days and nights and into weeks, neither seeming to give up, both seeking victory. Scothic's daughter searched for a solution to this endless fighting, and gathered wise hazelnut for both of them to eat and seek wisdom from. When they both took in the nourishing hazelnuts, they both saw visions of a draw between the two, and that both were equally matched in the ways of combat. Thus both laid down their arms in respect of one another's skills. Before Kukulin left, Scothic gave him the mighty spear Fearbolg, which was forged in the mountains by the little people in an age long past. She then named the mountains Kukulin in honor of their great battle that took place there. Kukulin then went south back to Ireland to live the life of a demigod hero, while Scothic stayed in her Fortress of Shadows until the day that she faded away from time and memory. So in my personal opinion, Scothic is a demigod being, and I say that out of experience now, because being here, this is a very otherworldly place. This castle has a presence to it. Now I should specify that the castle that stands here now was built after the story of Kukulin and Scothic. However, there was supposedly a site here already that was built on top of. And considering the large amount of Iron Age hill forts that exist on this area, I would say that is more than likely true that there was something here before this current castle was built. Now, that could mean that someone read this story or heard this story at some point and named this castle uh, Dunskath, uh, rather than actually it being that name originally. But that's just no fun now, is it? <laughs> uh, but truly, this presence up here is really interesting. I mean, you have a war goddess, essentially. She's teaching Ku Cullen, an already great warrior, how to fight uh, martial arts. And so she is a warrior being, perhaps a warrior goddess. Um, I do think there's some people that venerate her as a goddess, and I'm actually going to go over here and give an offering to her to kind of reach out. Because that's, again, where this channel kind of differs, I believe, uh, than some of the other history, mythology channels, is I am a practicing pagan, and so I do want to come to places like this, do the research, experience them, and then try to connect with them further uh, to get more information to, to see if I can build that relationship and connection with these ancient places. Since many of you will more than likely never get to visit here, I hope you do. It's a very beautiful location. Uh, but some observations here. We do have a well over here. Um, again, this could have been added much later. However, it is interesting because that's where I'm being called to give an offering here in a minute. Uh, also, the predominant plant on this uh, old uh, castle here is nettle, stinging nettle. And so absolutely everywhere is covered in this stuff, uh, which feels very fitting for a place of war, a place of you know combat, of a, a harsh plant that stings you when you touch it. So it's not very welcoming despite its beauty. I mean, there's little flowers absolutely everywhere. Uh, the fact that the castle's fallen apart in a way that makes it kind of a challenge to get in, I also really like. I mean, you have the beautiful view of the mountains here, uh, the calm of the sea, but I can imagine it's very fierce here during a storm. Uh, so there is a fierceness to this location that I think uh, attaches it to this, this idea of the shadowy one. And as we discussed, the Isle of Sky, the Isle of Mist and Clouds, uh, this place is very spooky at times. I'm very lucky to be here on a nice day. Uh, and this is a crazy out there theory, and I can't prove this. Uh, my evidence for this is we have possibly a goddess up here, a war goddess, in a land of beauty that was controlled at one point or at least visited by the Picts. This could be a Pictish goddess. I could be 100% wrong on this, but considering we know next to nothing about the Pictish deities, uh, you know, saying like, hey, this could be a Pictish deity. Scothic could be some form or variant of a Pictish god. Let me know what you think down below. This is just my thoughts running through my head. I'm not saying I, I'm going to necessarily venerate her as a Pictish being. I don't know if I'm 100% on that, but it's something that feels like a connection that could exist.
Now, of course, we have to talk about clans when it comes to talking about Scotland mythology and folklore. And here at the Isle of Skye, that is no different. Clans were very big at one point in its history. The biggest clan that had a presence here was Clan MacDonald, which of course had many clans under its name. I think it was over three or 400 different clans that are all tied to MacDonald. Now, what makes Clan MacDonald so famous is the fact that they were one of the biggest clans to stand up to the English rule and the removal of Highland culture. Now, sadly, this of course led to their final downfall at the Jacobite Rebellion, and then further the end of Highland culture, at least for a small period, uh, where the clan heritage and tartans and all this was actually outlawed under English rule. And after the failure of the Jacobite Rebellion, this is also when we see a lot of Scots move away from Scotland, their homeland, to the United States and other places around the world. For example, here in the Isle of Skye, over 20,000 people lived here right before the Jacobite Uprising, and then after it failed, only 9,000 people lived here a few years later because of the removal of Highland culture and the removal of Highland people. And many of these people fled to the United States, um, namely North Carolina, weirdly. And uh, this is where I have to admit that going here was part of my own ancestral research because my family has always said that we came from North Carolina around the same time of this removal of the Highland clan culture. When I came here, this place has a very spiritual connection to me. I mean, just looking around, it's absolutely gorgeous. I feel something here deep down. Uh, I was walking through the museum and I saw a portrait and it looks just like me when I didn't have a beard. Uh, and then I saw several portraits in there that look like family members I have. And so I definitely feel like there's a part of my ancestry that came from the McDonald uh, overarching clan title. And so there's definitely something to my heritage here and I can feel that. And of course, that's not the only thing that connects us to spirituality, but it is an important component. And seeking down one's ancestry is a really powerful experience. And I'm definitely feeling that here now as I stand here in the Isle of Skye. One of the last things I want to mention here is that the McDonald's themselves actually have legends that go all the way back to this hero named Summerled, whose name translates to Summer Hunter in the Old Norse. What's so fascinating about this is something we already discussed, is that combination of Celtic, Gallic culture with the Norse culture while the Vikings were settling here. Now, Summerled's name may be Norse, but what he actually did was remove a lot of the Norse invaders uh, and send them back to Norway, so to speak. And so that's where he got a lot of his fame, is by standing up to the Norse influence here and taking back the Isle of Skye uh, and establishing this lordship over the Isles. And so the McDonald's themselves traced their ancestry, their lineage, back to this hero of Summerled. And of course, we see this within Gallic, Celtic, and Norse culture of the veneration of heroes to the point of making them legends or almost deifying them. And you definitely see this uh, within the legends of Summerled, is he is almost deified because of how important he is to the McDonald heritage and the clan title. Another prominent clan of Skye was the McLoyds, who called the castle Dunvegan home in the west of the Isle. Sadly, I was not able to visit this castle for myself, but the legends contained within this family are ones that are worth knowing. First is the legend of the fairy flag, the most sacred of objects to the family which is still on display today in the castle. Legend tells us that the McLoyd chief Malcolm the Fat and Good married a fairy wife, whom he had a son with. His fairy life would then request to return to the fairy world to be with her people and leave both her husband and son behind. The chief agreed and escorted her to the fairy bridge she called home. With no mother to watch their son, he began to cry often, and on one particular evening the party below was growing so loud none could hear his cries. Later in the evening a nurse was walking by his room when she heard singing coming from within. What was inside was the fairy mother holding her son, whom she had wrapped in a cloth while singing a fairy song. The mother disappeared into the thin air as the nurse came into the room. The nurse then carried the baby in the fairy cloth down to Malcolm the Fat and Good. Upon holding his son in the cloth, he could hear the voice of the fairies sing once more. Everyone in the hall gathered to hear this magical song. This song is still remembered today within many people in the McLeod clan and is still sung very often to newborn babies to protect them and give them the strength of the fairies. Within this song and this flag was also a promise that should the McLeod family ever need help, that all they have to do is raise the fairy flag high and the fairies would answer, assisting them no matter what. This fairy flag can still be seen today within the Dunvegan castle and has been tested several times by scholars and historians and its origins are still quite mysterious. While it is badly damaged now, it has been cared for for hundreds of years by a series of standard bearers whose job was protection of this most holy object. There are several other objects kept within Dunvegan Castle that bear just as interesting stories. There are also several legends about fairies and their interactions with the various people that have lived in this castle in its over 700 years. 
I sadly do not have time to read all of them to you, so I highly recommend picking up the book by Oda Swire so that you can read them for yourself. Taking a brief pause in the middle of this video, if you're enjoying it, please make sure you like and subscribe and all that good YouTuber stuff. Even a comment goes very far these days. But if you enjoy the work I'm doing here, capturing the legends and myths of the ancient world all across Northern Europe, please think about supporting this channel on Patreon. This video was not easy to make and was filmed over several days. So please go down below and check out the benefits I have for you is there as well. And truly all of this helps the channel out so very much to all my Patreon subscribers. Thank you. The reason I walk these massive mountains in the mist and the rain in Scotland is all because of your wonderful donations and patronage. So thank you truly so very much. The legends around fairies all over Skye come in various forms, and not all of them pleasant. There are many stories about cattle and livestock going mad while eating in fairy fields, legends of people disappearing and being killed by the fairies out in the wild. The legends of the fairies can also be found within the names of various places across the isle, including Fairy Bridge, the Fairy Pools, and the Fairy Glen. It's a really interesting location because it's probably the most popular attraction next to the fairy pools is the fairy glen and there's so many instagram pictures of this place uh and as you can tell it's a very popular location uh the two hours i've been here it's been this crowded uh, basically the whole time. There's usually at least a dozen people around the, the main site here and hopefully you can see why from the footage that I'm showing you now. It is very beautiful. However, of all the sites I've shown you today, it is the one that most likely is the most modern because we really don't know who built the spiral in the center here. From my research, it seems like there has been no dating that I can actually tell when this spiral was made. We just know it was first mentioned in around the 1800s, early 1900s. And the most predominant theory is that someone during the Victorian era built this spiral because this is when the interest in Druidry, Celtic paganism, and mythology was becoming more popular once again. But my counterpoint to that theory is the location of this is very rural and not somewhere that I believe a Victorian era archaeologist would come or someone interested in this time period uh, would come here and make something like this in the countryside. Now this place is naturally beautiful undeniably but we're pretty far away from civilization. The nearest town is probably less than a couple thousand people and so I really don't see any of the local farmers doing this unless they were just trying to build tourism which also wouldn't make sense because I don't think they're very fond of the tourists in the countryside, at least around here. Especially now with how popular this site has become, with thousands and millions of people probably visiting the site every single year. Now with that, there is a lot of modern folklore around this site, and I, I really want to emphasize the modern part here because a lot of the stories you'll hear about the Fairy Glen come from at least the last 50 years when tours became more popular. I do have a theory of why these stories exist, and it's very similar to why we have folk tales in general. The main rules given to people by the tour guides when visiting Fairy Glen are don't whistle, don't tell the Fae your name, don't go into the spiral, don't take anything from the Glen, and don't accept any offerings from the Fae and you should destroy any gifts that the Fae leave you. Now there's definitely a part of this that is just simply mythology and folklore around Fae and elves and little people in general, is that they're very mischievous and it, I think this mischievousness came from the Christian era for sure, but we definitely see the little people, the spirits, have existed all around the world, particularly in Northern and Central Europe. And we even see some of these rules apply to Native American traditions as well when it comes to spirits, uh, particularly with not whistling. This is something that we teach people in the States with the Fellowship of Northern Tradition is that whistling in the woods is actually bad. Uh, now this changes a little bit depending on where you are because I know uh, I think in the Scandinavian tradition uh, waking up the spirits is a thing like knocking wood uh, is a way to awaken the spirits and not necessarily seen as a bad thing. Uh, but the entire subject around Fae and spirits is something I've kind of talked about on various videos on this channel. Highly recommend my house spirit video if you haven't checked it out already. And uh, I've made an elves video as well. But I will be talking a little bit more specifically about the Fae here very soon. But the final thing I want to mention about this site, I mean, yes, it's modern, but my experience here has definitely been fey spirit -y. Even though I'm not really big on some of the, uh, the modern additions to this, I can't deny that this site, one, is beautiful, is absolutely stunning to just be standing in because it's very unique. It's one of the oldest earthen structures in the world, created by probably an ancient volcano. Uh, just very, very windy <laughs> uh, and just overall has a presence to it. But also, the site is very mischievous, as I have witnessed here in my brief time being here. 
On my way up here, I walked by a woman who actually had broken her ankle. I assisted a little bit in getting her down the hill a little ways, and we called an ambulance. Uh, I believe she's fine now. I saw the ambulance come. Uh, and then I've seen several people slip and fall here. I've had to stop people a few times. Uh, there were some people right in the center of the Glen uh, taking some either uh, really bad selfies and or TikTok videos of them doing stupid poses and they were kicking around the rocks and stuff. And so I had to get out my dad voice and stop them from doing that. Luckily they did, but when I actually climbed up the rock here, another group came by and they started picking up the stones and moving them around and I had to yell at them. And so I think my retirement plan now is to come dressed as an old druid Gandalf figure, stand upon the rock and yell at people when they disrespect the site. Uh, and that's my ultimate theory around why these rules of the Fey existed here, as they were created by the tour guides to kind of create this, hey, don't touch that. Uh, and I hopefully it becomes more effective because it definitely seems like the site does get disrespected. Um, I wish there was some signage here telling people not to do this as well, even in the fun way around the story of the Fey. Just remember, don't take anything from the Fairy Glen and respect your ancient sites. When I first visited the Isle of Skye, I was overwhelmed by its beauty, its presence, and its spirit. And after reading the work by Otis Swire, my heart is full of an immense love and appreciation for this sacred and mysterious place. While many people visit this isle to see the fairy glens and the fairy pools, very few people will experience the mythology and folklore that gives these places their names. I hope this video has given you an in-depth look at this amazing location and given you a piece of the spiritual presence that is the Isle of Skye.